Thank you, Dr. Sunil. I may request Dr. Angelina to please introduce the first speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Nuala Lucas. She, we've already had a talk from her. She is working at Northwick Park Hospital and she's also a, a representative of Inter, uh, International Journal of Obstetric Anesthesia. She would be talking to us about the hypertensive disorders in pregnancy and update and uh, anesthesiologist perception. Over to you, Dr. Nuala. Hello, my name is Nuala Lucas and I work in the UK. I'd like to thank the organisers for laying on this fantastic web-based meeting and asking me to contribute. My remit is to discuss preeclampsia and update for anaesthetists. Over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to discuss a little bit of the epidemiology and clinical features of preeclampsia. And then I'm going to touch on some key questions for anaesthetic practice. So first of all, defining preeclampsia. Traditionally, we might be familiar with the definition of hypertension associated with proteinuria and edema, but we have a more up-to-date definition that describes the clinical picture we see much more accurately. Preeclampsia is now defined as a hypertensive disorder that develops after 20 weeks of pregnancy with the coexistence of one or more new onset conditions. And this can include any of proteinuria or some evidence of maternal organ dysfunction. And of course, the other organ we need to consider in pregnancy is the baby. So if you have fetal growth restriction from utero placental dysfunction associated with preeclampsia in association with hypertension, then this is preeclampsia. Now, we generally perceive preeclampsia as a disorder of pregnancy. But we now have a good body evidence that suggests the risks of preeclampsia continue after the pregnancy has ended. And this very nice systematic review from Bellamy, published over 10 years ago now, demonstrates an increased risk of stroke and thromboembolism and ischemic heart disease in women who've had preeclampsia during a pregnancy. The risk of cardiovascular disease later in life is doubled, and the risk of renovascular disease later in life is multiplied by a factor of five. And it has been suggested that when we're screening patient, perioperative patients who are elderly, for women, we should be asking them about a history of preeclampsia when they were um, in their childbearing years. And what about the clinical features of preeclampsia? We know that it is a multi-system disorder. And here I've tried to highlight some of the more uh, relevant clinical features, particular to anaesthetic practice. And of course, we worry about laryngeal edema causing difficult intubation. We're concerned about the effect on the hematological system, in particular if thrombocytopenia develops that might preclude the provision of epidural spinal anaesthesia. And of course, when we're giving fluids in the perioperative period, we've got to be cautious because we don't want to cause pulmonary edema. But there are several other end organ effects that we need to be aware of. So let's look at some of the key questions for anaesthetic practice. And I'm going to try and run through each of these in turn. First of all, how do I treat the blood pressure? Now, to answer this question, I think we need to consider two elements. Firstly, what blood pressure to aim for and what drug and route should we be using? So I want you to briefly consider what is more important, systolic or diastolic? hypertension. Now in preeclampsia and cerebrovascular disease, we know that in women of childbearing age, preeclampsia is the biggest single risk factor for stroke and hemorrhagic stroke is the most common type of stroke associated with preeclampsia. We also know from several studies that systolic hypertension directly correlates with the risk of stroke. In pregnant patients who suffer stroke, most occur postpartum. And because of this correlation between systolic hypertension and um, stroke, the successive maternal confidential death inquiry reports in the UK have reduced the treatment systolic blood pressure to less than 150. Now let's consider which drug we should be using and which route. Now there have been two excellent systematic reviews published on this subject, both reasonably recently, and I'd urge you to take a look at both of them. There, there's a wealth of information about this topic. I'm going to consider the one from 2014, um, although the findings from the second one are broadly similar. So the one from 2014 looked at 15 RCTs, randomized controlled trials, including almost a, a, a thousand women. They divided their analysis into patients who'd received oral or sublingual nifedipine and those who'd received intravenous agents, libitalol or hydralazine. And what they found was that nifedipine, orally or sublingually, achieved treatment success in most women similar to intravenous hydralazine or libitalol. 
They did note that more maternal hypotension occurred with the rapidly acting sublingual nifedipine. And remember, although we want to reduce the blood pressure, we don't want to do it too quickly because that can compromise a placental perfusion and cause fetal distress. So we want to bring it down, but not too rapidly. And they didn't find any difference in adverse maternal or fetal outcomes between the two groups, the oral nifedipine or intravenous libetrol and hydralazine. Now, this is one of the studies that contributed to the systematic reviews, and I just think it demonstrates very nicely the uh, very similar impact on blood pressure of oral nifedipine or intravenous libitol for hypertensive emergency in pregnancy. And I wanted to show this because I think as anaesthetists, we like to give intravenous agents. We're very comfortable with using intravenous agents. But I really wanted to emphasize that oral agents can have a very effective role in the treatment of preeclampsia. So my take home messages here are aim for a systolic of less than 150. And if you've got somebody with chronic hypertension in the UK, we actually aim for a slightly lower target of 135 over 85. Oral libitalol, nifedipine, and methyl dopa should be used as first-line antihypertensive agents for non-severe hypertension. Be prepared to change if there is an inadequate response. Some women don't respond so well to nifedipine for reasons we can't describe or libitalol. So if you don't get a response after a couple of doses, be prepared to change agents. And I haven't discussed it, but I've added on here, of course, the crucial impact of analgesia. And I'm particularly considering the provision of epidural analgesia for labor. And finally, at the time of delivery, we should be avoiding ergometrin as a, a, a eutrotonic agent because we know that this can put the blood pressure up. Now, next point I want to consider is what is a safe platelet count for epidural or spinal anesthesia? We're concerned if, about the risk of vertebral canal hematoma in a patient who has a thrombocytopenia. Now, we know it is a rare um, occurrence. We know that in general, obstetric patients don't have the traditional risk factors of being elderly or on anticoagulation therapy. But we know that it is a catastrophic complication with a poor prognosis. There's been some updated evidence in this area recently, and I'd urge you to take a look at this fantastic systematic review and meta-analysis, considering lumbar neuraxial procedures, not just in obstetric patients, but in a range of thrombocytopenic patients across various populations. I want to focus on one of the papers that contributed to this systematic review that did consider obstetric patients, this uh, one from Lee et al. Now, what this group did was they uh, undertook a systematic review um, of thrombocytopenia and the provision of epidural or spinal anesthesia in obstetric patients. And then they combined systematic review data with data, clinical op uh, retrospective op data from their own perioperative outcome group. And they divided their thrombocytopenic patients into three cohorts, 0 to 49,000 platelets, 50 to 69,000, and 70,000 to 100,000. And then they, as I said, they combined the data from systematic review with their, their own observational data. Now they found that across these three platelet groups, these three thrombocytopenic groups, there was no epidural hematomas that required surgical decompression. But then they calculated confidence intervals for each of these three groups. Now, with 0 to 49,000 platelets, they found very broad confidence intervals of 0 to 11. But once you get to, got to a platelet count of greater than 70,000, the confidence intervals narrowed very nicely. So I think this provides fairly reassuring evidence that a platelet count of greater than 70,000 is safe for the provision of epidural or spinal anesthesia. Just to try and uh, add a little bit more nuance to the discussion, of course, if you don't do an epidural or spinal, you may have, you're, and the woman needs an operative delivery, you may have to give a general anesthetic. And we know that the provision of general anesthesia in preeclamptic patients has carries its own risks. And this figure, this from work from Levi et al, shows very nicely that as your platelet count drops, your risk of requiring general anesthesia for cesarean delivery increases. So to, to su summarize an approach for the management of epidural spinal anesthesia in a preeclamptic patient with thrombocytopenia. I think a platelet count of 70,000 is now acceptable to provide spinal or epidural anesthesia or analgesia. I think not, we don't just have to check the platelet count, we also have to consider the trends and the possible trajectory. So where is the platelet count going? And I think we, this element about the trends is particularly important. If you've got a woman who's had a reasonably stable platelet count of between 70 to 80 for the last few days, I think she represents a lower risk than a woman who perhaps had a platelet count of 100 two days ago, 
yesterday her platelet count was 80 and today it's early 70s. So I think it's important to consider the trends. I think a final point is to remember that the risks remain for the removal of epidural catheter. So if you've had a woman who's had an epidural catheter cited for several hours during labor, you may want to check the platelet count before you remove the epidural catheter. Moving on to consider what anesthetic for cesarean section, and I particularly want to consider whether spinal or epidural anesthesia is the best approach. In preeclampsia, the anesthetic goals really are about mater uh, optimizing maternal blood pressure and cardiac output to optimize utero-placental perfusion and fetal well-being. We want to also, of course, prevent uh, rapid rises in blood pressure to avoid seizures and stroke. Now, historically, in patients with severe preeclampsia, spinal anesthesia was avoided because of the risk of severe hypotension that could decrease utero-placental perfusion and compromise fetal well-being. So what evidence do we have in this area? Well, these three trials compared hemodynamic changes who'd uh, in patients with preeclampsia who'd received spinal anesthesia with normotensive pituitaries who'd also received spinal anesthesia. And in all three studies, th there was no increased instance of hypotension in the preeclamptic patients compared to the normotensive patients. And what about when you consider epidural versus spinal anesthesia in preeclamptic pituitaries? Now, um, in these two studies, one study did find a higher instance of hypotension in patients who'd received spinal anesthesia compared to ephedrine. But in the other study, there was a similar instance of hypotension and similar usage of ephedrine to maintain blood pressure in both, the in both groups of patients who'd received epidural and spinal anesthesia. But before I move away from this, I just want to highlight one aspect about these two studies. So these are both from two, one's from 2005 and one's from 1999. Now those studies are both relatively old in the history of obstetric anesthesia. We live in an era where phenylephrine infusions are now ubiquitous and the, mat, um, and the management of blood pressure during caesarean section under spinal, epidural, under spinal anesthesia in particular is much more straightforward. And with the use of phenylephrine infusions, we have much greater cardio stability. I think another point to remember is that um, we, I think as obstetricians have become much more skilled at man detecting and management managing preeclampsia. So we much less frequently see very severe cases of preeclampsia presenting for cesarean section. So my take home message here is that spinal or combined spinal epidural anesthesia is safe in, for cesarean section in a preeclamptic parturient with meticulous attention to prophylaxis and management of the hypertension with a phenylephrine infusion. I want to consider the hypertensive response to laryngoscopy and the management of particularly if you do find yourself in the position of having to provide a general anesthetic for cesarean section. Now, of course, in this situation, what we're really worried about is the hypertensive response, potentially leading to uh, a stroke, perioperative stroke, because of the rise of blood pressure. And this very old paper, which wouldn't be possible now, demonstrates this increase in blood pressure um, nicely. And of course, sometimes we forget about extubation, but it also occurs during extubation as well. Now, there's very little evidence to guide us in this area. This is a survey of UK practice that was undertaken some years ago now that considered not just the anaesthetist's own choice, but department policy in this area. The choice of agent to attenuate the pressor response to laryngoscopy. And you can see a wide variety of agents are used. Probably um, alfentanil or short-acting opioids the most popular. Uh, this is a systematic review looking at the use of induction opioids during GA for caesarean section, not particularly considering preeclampsia, but all GAs. And what this group found was that there was no significant difference in any of the agents used in APGAR scores at one minute, although fentanyl did reduce APGAR scores at five minutes. I would also emphasize that there wasn't a, a, this, the evidence underlying this systematic review meta-analysis was not high quality randomized controlled trials. So even this finding about fentanyl, I would uh, interpret cautiously in my own practice. My take home message here is that there is a wide choice of effective agents and my personal preference is a short acting opioid like such as alfentanil and a, what I call a proper dose of induction agent. So this is when I, I titrate very carefully the induction agent and I um, to effect. So I, I would only give my muscle relaxant when I'm absolutely certain that I've lost the eyelash reflex and the patient is asleep. I don't just give a, a single bolus pre-calculated dose of induction agent. I titrate my induction agent to effect.
The last thing I want to touch on is fluid management in preeclampsia. We know that preeclamptic patients are vulnerable to fluid overload. They can have an increased preload, there can be cardiac causes uh, at play, myopathic ventricle, diastolic dysfunction. We know that systemic vascular resistance is increased in preeclampsia. And finally, there are other tissue factors such as reduced oncotic pressure and increased capillary permeability. This nice review undertaken by uh, the South African group um, looked at the influence of fluid management at, on outcomes in preeclampsia, but they were unable to draw any firm conclusions over the, the optimal choice and strategy of fluid management in preeclampsia. So this is what I think we, the factors I think we should be considering in our own practice. I think we need to remember that after delivery, oliguria in preeclamptic patient is almost inevitable and fluid restriction is generally appropriate. Always check that there's no bleeding or sepsis, but if you're certain that there isn't those factors at play, I think the fluid restriction is appropriate. When you're giving fluids, balance the risks of giving too much and causing pulmonary edema and giving too little and causing an acute kidney injury, possibly leading to dialysis. We like to use non-steroidals, but they should be avoided in this group of patients. But ultimately, I think fluid management comes down to clinical judgment, caution, and frequent re-evaluation. We don't tend to use many central lines in preeclamptic patients anymore, but we're becoming increasingly adept, and, and in particular our ITU colleagues, using um, point-of-care ultrasound. And I think this possibly has a key role to play in the mat fluid management of very severe preeclamptic patients. So just to conclude, in terms of treating the blood pressure, aim for a systolic of less than 150 millimeters of mercury and oral agents are effective. In terms of platelet, a safe platelet count for the provision of spinal epidural, absolute cutoffs are decreasing and I think 70 is the new 100, but ultimately I think you should always use an individualized approach. Spinal anesthesia is safe for cesarean section with meticulous attention to the management of the vasopressor phenylephrine. In terms of providing, preventing the hypertensive response to laryngoscopy, short-acting opioids, or the agent that you are most familiar with, but I, my personal preference is to use short-acting opioids. And fluid management should be judicious, protocolized, and I do believe there is an increasing role for point-of-care ultrasound assessment. Um, if you're interested in reading more about this topic, this is a recently published excellent uh, review on the topic, um, a multi-professional uh, review, and this barcode should take you straight to the paper, QR code should take you straight to the paper. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Noala. It was indeed wonderful listening to your uh, enriching talk on a very pertinent topic. And with this, we would move on to our next speaker and we can take the questions at the end of the session. Uh, it's indeed a great pleasure to welcome my mentor, uh, Dr. Rajesh Sharima, uh, who's the current uh, professor and head at the prestigious All India Institute of Medical Sciences at uh, Delhi. Uh, she has been an uh, alumni of AIMS and has been there for, I think, more than 31 or 32 years there as faculty. Um, having uh, more than 100 publications and one textbook and more, many, many CME lectures. She's indeed an expert in obstetrics, pediatric and endocrine anesthesia, and of course has set protocols for exit abnormal placentation and labor analgesia at AIMS. We welcome you, ma'am, to speak on uh, yet another important uh, topic of help AFLP complex anesthetic considerations. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. This is the benefits. But I, I'm, I'm reasonably comfortable with a, a platelet count of around 70. But I think for me, the key thing I look at is I just look to see what the tra trajectory has been over the last few days. Um, so, you know, somebody who has got very severe preeclampsia, I would really want a, a platelet count within the last two to four hours to be absolutely certain. Sure. Absolutely. Um, Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. Uh, Noala, would you uh, like to use a prophylactic dose or a reactive dose of a vasopressor in severe preeclamptics? Yeah. Um, you're talking about under spinal anesthesia for cesarean section, Sananda. What do you do then? Yeah. I, I would start my phenylephrine infusion in, in exactly the same way. I, I, I generally tend to start a rate of 20 mils an hour at 50 mics per mil. Um, and I just monitor very judiciously 
what happens to the blood pressure, really keeping a very close eye on it. My experience of preeclamptic patients is that they don't tend to drop their blood pressure as, uh, as much as a patient who doesn't have preeclampsia. I generally, they seem to be less vulnerable to spinal hypotension, but I, I would start a vasopressor and, and treat them in exactly the same way. And your um, choice of vasopressor would be phenylephrine, right? Yes, phenylephrine is always my, my first put and choice of vasopressor. It uh, develops bradycardia. And, uh, so, it, so it once they start, I mean, I always keep a close eye on the heart rate. And I have to say that I always know where my ephedrine is and I always know where my glycopyrrolate is. Um, I think everyone has a different experience of using phenylephrine. And, you know, the, the, the most, uh, the highest infusion rate I have, ever really gone up to and only for a very brief period was about 40 mils an hour or 50 mics per mil and um, even then you know the bradycardia can start to become a problem and of course it's not just the bradycardia associated with phenylephrine we know that when you get a reasonably uh, a block our spinal blocks can come sometimes cause a bradycardia so I think we have to be very vigilant about heart rate um, and I always know where ephedrine is. And, it, um, and I always keep an eye to see where the heart rate is before I, I start, because it's not, so, it's not always just the change. It's where they've started from as well. So, yes, I think that we shouldn't be afraid to use ephedrine when the heart rate uh, precludes the use of phenylephrine. Thank you. Thank you. Mike. I think we have the talk ready and... Uh... more we'll get back to you again uh, thank you so much and we'll hand over the mic to the organizers to please play the video i, I can hear it somebody really has two devices on it could be you know audible from that no i think it's another like the organizer switch the other mic okay so anyway i uh, it's it's oh, madam your madam your screen is shared in the auditorium now has, oh, okay, but uh, then there was a waste of time. It, <laughs> it's okay, okay ma'am. <laughs> it's beyond our control. So I think you can start, ma'am. So I'll madam, start. Please, and madam, I hope, please start. Uh, yeah, I'm madam, starting. Please start because your, your, your thing is seen in the auditorium. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm starting. But there's a noise I can hear from back. I don't know. Somebody's talking very loudly. Uh, yeah, now it is gone. So uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. And... Uh, um, I am sort of, I bring greetings from Ames, as all of you know, which has been my uh, institution and I really cherish it and I cherish my association and whatever I am today, it is because of this institution. And my uh, very deep gratitude to Dr. Sunanda Gupta and Dr. Sunil for always remembering to call me and invite me. And also uh, hello and thanks to Anju for moderating. So Ames is turning, uh, completing 65, in fact, tomorrow. So we'll be spend, uh, celebrating Institute Day. And this great institution is also sort of, you know, uh, going towards retirement age, but I hope it never retires. So uh, coming to today's uh, topic, which I've been uh, given to speak about. So if we look at uh, liver disorders in pregnancy, they form a very small uh, part of the complete uh, spectrum of diseases in pregnancy. And we can broadly divide them into... Uh, those that are unique to pregnancy and those that are unrelated to pregnancy. And when a pregnancy um, happens to a patient who's having chronic liver disease, but as of today, our focus is on two uh, entities, which is the acute fatty liver of pregnancy and the other is the HELP syndrome. So if you see the timeline of liver disease in pregnancy, we'll find that the HELP syndrome starts somewhere in the second trimester and also extends slightly into the postpartum phase. Whereas the acute fatty liver of pregnancy restricts itself mainly to the third trimester. The acute fatty liver of pregnancy is a potentially lethal entity and it is a true obstetric and a medical emergency and very often difficult to differentiate from help. It has a very unique pathophysiology which we'll be covering in the next few slides and the implications of delaying the diagnosis are very, very ominous because it can cause rapid deterioration of the mother and death. So it's very important for the anesthesiologist to understand the pathophysiology so that we can understand its obstetrical impact and thereby plan our management much better. So in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of breakthrough in the understanding of the causation of acute fatty liver of pregnancy. In fact, it has been related to disorders in the fetal fatty acid oxidation mechanism. So here there's a small drawing of a cell wall membrane, the hepatocyte and the mitochondrion. So initially when we have this long chain fatty acid, which is the small purple 
thing you can see there and this is the fatty acid binding protein so the fatty acid binding protein takes it into the cytoplasm and then from the cytoplasm it is taken by the carnitine shuttle into the mitochondria so into the mitochondria we see a series of steps happening which convert the long chain fatty acid into acyl coa and acetyl coa the names are very blurred but they must be familiar which are part of our energy cycle so this is the inside of a mitochondria and here this green area represents the enclosed area of the mitochondrial trifunctional protein because there are three enzymatic steps which occur inside this area as you can see the step number 1 is the acylation of the fatty acid it gets converted into its acyl form that is the enoyl form and comes inside this mitochondrial trifunctional protein here there are three steps and of them this third step which consists of the hydroxy acyl dehydrogenase is one of the most vital steps because if there is a hold up of this enzyme is absent then everything proximal to that gets dammed up in the mitochondria and then comes out however it can also happen that the whole of the mitochondrial trifunctional protein itself is absent in which case we'll have accumulation of these precursors which don't get then metabolized so in the circulation what happens is that we have accumulation of both medium chain fatty acids or long chain fatty acids depending on the enzymatic stoppage wherever it is then these uh, fatty acids which are highly lipotoxic they reach the maternal liver where they immediately give rise to inflammatory pathways the risk factors for uh, primary uh, gravidas who develop this are being in the pri uh, or primary gravidas and multiple gestation because more uh, fetuses mean more load of fatty acids and other risk factors so it is also uh, known well known that in the third trimester there is an increased demand for fatty acids both in the fetus and the placenta and the maternal lipase it gives uh, it metabolizes the triglycerides in maternal blood and gives rise to or breaks it up into free fatty acids now if the free fatty acid load is already increased in the maternal blood and if there is a fetus with the long chain hydroxy acyl dehydrogenase enzyme deficiency which, which is also known as l chat deficiency you can imagine that the load of the maternal long chain fatty acids is highly increased added to that if the mother is in a stressful environment and is consuming high fat food this also adds to the fatty acid burden the consequences of this heavy fatty acid burden are multifold initially there is this microvesicular fatty steatosis of the liver which impacts mainly the metabolic functions of the liver leading to reduced bilirubin conjugation and impaired lactate clearance and reduced production of coagulation factors it also severely affects the functioning of other organs like kidney the pancreas the placenta itself and also endothelial dysfunction in general now the fetus which is carrying this l chat deficiency also does not fare well because accumulation of the long chain 3 hydroxy fatty acids impact the brain eye and the pancreas and these neonates have to be immediately taken care of very vigorously by the neonatologist so it is our duty to tell the attending neonatologist that a a, a patient with uh, help, with uh, acute fatty liver of pregnancy is about to deliver on presentation they present with very vague symptoms of abdominal pain and malaise and some nausea and vomiting but as the disease advances they develop jaundice and polydipsia polydipsia is a very feature which is unique to acute fatty liver this is because of reduced clearance of vasopressinase by the affected liver because of that the vasopressinase actively destroys all the vasopressin in the body and these women develop a diabetes insipidus like state they rapidly evolve to liver failure and encephalopathy if rapid delivery is not undertaken and the lab findings are very they stand out for the increased prothrombin time the leukocytosis and most importantly hypoglycemia we use criteria known as the swansea criteria to diagnose acute fatty liver of pregnancy amongst these criteria if there are six or more then it is taken to be diagnostic of fatty liver of pregnancy there are a few drawbacks of these criteria because the patients are already very ill by the time they meet the criteria and therefore it is not useful for early diagnosis which is required in these patients so uh, the antithrombin 3 deficiency which occurs in these patients is considered to be more specific and it has been seen that the antithrombin 3 levels actually start dipping way before the transaminase levels and the ldh levels increase in these patients and it has also been found that an antithrombin 3 activity less than 65% of the baseline is highly suggestive of development of severe liver dysfunction the other problems with acute fatty liver are that since a uh, good number of these patients are not hypertensive they are not tested frequently as much as the preeclamptic patients and help patients are 
who are actually recommended to undergo blood tests frequently and in whom laboratory abnormalities may be found very early and they are under some kind of medical surveillance. So an alternate assessment plan has been proposed by Minakami. So uh, this paper has suggested that if we have patients whose AST levels and LDH levels are already high, then one can estimate their platelets. If the platelets are less and the antithrombin uh, levels are not very affected, the patient is likely to have HELP syndrome. On the other hand, if the antithrombin activity level is much less and the platelets are normal, then it is more likely to be acute fatty liver of pregnancy. The obstetric management is highly time sensitive and the patients have to be immediately transferred to a tertiary care for management. There is absolutely no evidence for expectant management in these patients and vaginal delivery is suitable only in a very small number of patients with the care that episiotomy has to be avoided in order to prevent postpartum hemorrhage, which is very common in these patients. And since rapid clinical deterioration may occur up to the point of severe liver failure or even liver transplant in some patients, it is very important and logical to include a liver transplant anesthesiologist to form part of the multidisciplinary team which is going to take care of the patient. So pre-delivery, the anesthesiologist has to check the fluid status and volume replacement, review the recent uh, blood tests and optimize blood pressure if they, with the use of vasopressors if required, ensure that cross-match blood is available and most importantly, set up good invasive monitoring in the form of an arterial line and good large pore IV access. Labor analgesia in these patients is reported only for very few patients, only if the coagulation status is totally reassuring. And the, very, the majority of these patients actually have cesarean delivery. And again, uh, neuraxial uh, anesthesia for cesarean delivery is again, uh, having the same concerns as has been um, elaborated by Dr. Nuala in the previous lecture. So uh, the coagulation status and the platelet function are not very reliable because they don't really reflect the current status of the coagulation. And unfortunately, in this group of patients, viscoelastic tests are of very limited value. With general anesthesia, there is the concern of effects of intubation on the ICP and, of course, airway concerns, especially if it's a difficult airway with edema and the propensity of bleeding. If general anesthesia is the technique of choice, one must ensure that experienced personnel are there to manage the airway, preferably with the video laryngoscope. The head end has to be elevated to provide some kind of relief for the in increased intracranial pressure. Remifentanil, if available, is a good co-induction agent. Propofol matches all the criteria which is required for these patients. And maintenance can be done with any inhalation agent, but um, preferably less than one mac concentration to avoid any cerebral vasodilation and one should avoid hypocapnia at all costs. The ventilatory management should ensure that we uh, avoid high airway pressures and high PEEP. So there are a few papers which discuss the outcome of these patients. This is a very old paper, nearly 25 years old, which remarks on the very high maternal morbidity, which includes encephalopathy, pulmonary edema, and respiratory arrest in this group of patients. What is to be remembered is that these patients take at least a week to become normal in the form of their liver status and the coagulopathy. So they must be tended to in the hospital itself for one week and should not be discharged as normal cesarean patients. This, a patient, this paper which discussed uh, more than 30 consecutive cases remarks on the use of an AFLP triad. So if we look at the symptoms and look at the laboratory findings and look at the complications, then the authors recommend that patients who satisfy this triad or fit into this triad should be evaluated further to confirm acute fatty liver of pregnancy. Uh, it is also seen that these patients are uh, have a very high uh, incidence of risk of sepsis also. So uh, it is quite likely that they may they are good candidates for uh, development of epidural abscess. So even if uh, neuraxial anesthesia is planned for them, one should be very careful to uh, take care and to look after the catheter properly. And there is a real issue with provision of analgesia, since I've enlisted, en uh, enlisted all these techniques. If neuraxial anesthesia is not possible, then what do we do? So paracetamol is safe, but then with evolving liver disease, one would rather tend to under-prescribe paracetamol. NSAIDs we would rather uh, not use because of the fear of hepaturenal syndrome in this uh, group of patients. Opioids have a very delayed clearance, and there are many reports of hepatic encephalopathy and coma being precipitated by the use of pethidine and morphine, which ultimately required mechanical ventilation. Uh, this uh, fairly recent paper, which reviewed the results of cesarean section in patients of acute fatty liver of pregnancy, reported 16 cases which were done under neuraxial anesthesia and 12 with general anesthesia. And even though the series was very small, there were two deaths in this series. This was from China. 
And uh, the authors advocate that these patients should have completely individualized management and vigilance, and there's no blanket uh, guidelines that one can follow. So now we come to the HELP syndrome, which is a constellation of, again, clinical and laboratory anomalies in pregnant women in their third trimester. The majority of them present before delivery, about a one third of them present postpartum. The etiopathogenesis of HELP is something which is very, very uh, different and very, uh, it's a very different uh, pathogenesis compared to uh, acute fatty liver of pregnancy. It is intimately related to the vascular placental invasion because it is considered to be one end of the spectrum of preeclampsia and eclampsia. So uh, when the placenta does not implant properly, it leads to a lot of vascular remodeling, utroplacental ischemia, and the structural defects which result finally in the formation of the placenta lead to a lot of thrombosis occurring in these vessels, microangiopathy, which leads to microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and severe liver damage. So this table actually shows us what happens. So when there is an aberrant uh, placental development, it immediately activates an abnormal maternal immune response. And this immune response translates itself into a systemic maternal inflammatory response because the uh, uh, body starts treating the placenta as almost a foreign organ. And as the, the inflammatory response spreads to the blood vessels, RBCs actually are sheared as they flow through damaged vessels, resulting in microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. And these thrombi reach the hepatic circulation, leading to hepatic damage and elevated liver enzymes. And then, of course, the low platelets. So uh, these patients too present with non-specific symptoms like weight gain, right upper quadrant pain, and non-specific viral-like illness. But uh, compared to the patients with acute fatty liver of pregnancy, these patients, the majority of them have high blood pressure. So they may also exhibit cerebral or visual symptoms or even pulmonary edema. So the Mississippi HELP criteria or the Tennessee HELP criteria uh, are useful in categorizing the severity of the HELP syndrome. Based, these are ba uh, based on mainly the platelet counts and the levels of the AST and the LDH. So uh, we can see the characteristic uh, hemolysis on the periphery blood smear and uh, liver enzymes are usually elevated to more than 70 to 80 units per liter. And the platelets can be um, uh, reduced anywhere from less than 50,000 downwards. Regarding obstetric management, delivery is recommended when the patient crosses 34 weeks of gestation. And this, as a rule, intravenous magnesium sulfate, a four gram loading dose followed by two grams per hour is imperative for seizure prophylaxis in these patients during labor and for 24 hours postpartum. And vaginal delivery may be considered in these patients quite nicely, but we have to rule out any fetal distress or any risk of disseminated intravascular coagulation. And uh, especially the obstetrician should look for signs of placental abruption. It is also recommended by many authorities to transfuse platelets in these patients if the counts are less than 20,000. Uh, 20, and if the patient is scheduled for a cesarean, it should be built up to 50,000 uh, per microliter. Uh, this transmission needs to be done only once because thrombocytopenia generally improves after delivery. Uh, coming to the anesthetic management for operative delivery, so uh, uh, there are two, uh, there are uh, two or three papers which I'd like to share with you. This paper by uh, Vigil de Gracia, which covered nearly 120 women, uh, two thirds of them had cesarean section, about a one third had vaginal delivery. And uh, the majority had a diagnosis of help preoperatively itself. And epidural anesthesia was received by people. Um, and some of them, in fact, had platelets as low as 19,000. In about three or four of them, the platelet counts actually were not available before the epidural was cited. So similarly, in the spinal anesthesia group also, there were patients who had lower counts, less than 50,000. But on the whole, uh, there was no uh, uh, uneventful, it was all uneventful. There was no adverse outcome of any of the neuraxial blocks. And so the authors said that neuraxial block could be safely performed with platelets counts, which were more than 50,000. Uh, this uh, paper, which covered about 100 patients, uh, remarked upon the fact that uh, CSE was generally given to people, uh, patients who had counts of more than 100,000, but it can be safely given even if the counts are up to 70,000. There are other things to be observed, and as Dr. Noella very rightly pointed out, we have to definitely keep an eye on the speed of decrease of the platelet count, the trends, and especially the previous days and the previous days uh, uh, counts are very, very important. We also have to see whether there's any other subtle evidence of disseminated intravascular coagulation. Is it an emergent procedure? Is there an anticipated intubation difficulty? So these are all the conditions which have to be taken into account before we just plan for a neuraxial block. 
but there are definitely other advantages of neuraxial analgesia and help because it provides just the right kind of hemodynamic stability by avoiding the hypertensive responses both to labor pain as well as to other any noxious responses and of course we can avoid general anesthesia especially in patients with a difficult airway and we can obtain the hypertensive responses to laryngoscopy intubation and extubation and as was rightly pointed out the principal cause of mortality in preeclampsia and eclampsia is cerebral hemorrhage or a stroke so it is very important that these patients are not allowed to experience pain which can cause a lot of hemodynamic upsets having said that there is a single report of a spinal subarachnoid hematoma in a patient with help syndrome now this patient was a 39 year gravida uh, who presented with very high blood pressure epigastric pain oligohydramnios -hydram and non reassuring fetal heart rate and she consented for a, a cesarean section under spinal anesthesia her platelet counts at that time were 90000 so uh, the spinal block resolved in 5 hours but on day 2 the patient developed new neurological symptoms fecal incontinence and at that time the platelets were found to be only 20000 with an elevation of the fibrinogen degradation products however this patient was managed conservatively and uh, she had an mri done she had in fact serial mri done which showed a large hematoma a flat hematoma lying anterior to the cord and the author said that her uh, the reason why she had developed less of neurax a neurological symptoms was probably the situation of the hematoma which was anteriorly and also the fact that it was spinal because the csf does wash away some of the blood and causes less compression and her paraparesis was therefore very mild but we have a red flag here so we have to be extremely vigilant for neurological signs not just on the day that we give the block but for at least 72 hours thereafter the patient should be under this thing so uh, finally i will just this put this slide to differentiate between help and aflp because i think it is very important for us to understand that if you look at the clinical signs then the patients with acute fatty liver of pregnancy have definitely signs of more significant liver dysfunction or even liver failure and ascites and hypoglycemia is one of their very prominent symptoms and in lab values they have leukocytosis and they have impaired renal uh, parameters they have a reduced level of anti thrombin 3 and they have a prolonged prothrombin time so this uh, presentation was more to highlight the point that help actually develops over weeks and because many of them are hypertensive these patients can be seen and they are usually optimized in at least many ways before they come but patients with acute fatty liver of pregnancy still tend to come very very late and they can rapidly progress to liver failure and coma and since they are, they have no hypertension and no other symptoms they are under very uh, uh, they are not under that kind of surveillance which is required for them so i hope this lecture was useful the take home points are that uh, they both are associated with high maternal morbidity and mortality and the differentiation is definitely very difficult acute fatty liver of pregnancy is based on a clinical and if possible a histological diagnosis help is purely mainly on laboratory diagnosis the prodromal symptoms are common in both but the patients with acute fatty liver tend to progress rapidly to liver failure if pregnancy is not terminated so focused assessment with recent labs optimization within the time limit and having adequate blood products available designing a very safe and expeditious delivery having a very low threshold for invasive monitoring and as usual vigilance for systemic complications and provision of organ support whenever required leads to a good maternal and a neonatal outcome thank you very much thank you so much ma'am uh, you could really manage it despite the technical glitches up here I, i hope i didn't overdo the time part so not at all ma'am it was very well within the time limit and excellent very well presentation as always thank you so much uh, we have a few questions for uh, dr nuala are you there i believe she left possibly so ma'am uh, perhaps uh, you could take them uh, there's a question that talks about uh, management for lscs uh, how would it be different in a patient who have had a prophylactic magnesium sulfate so uh, it it depends on whether you are planning a neuraxial uh, anesthesia for the patient or a general anesthetic and as all of you know magnesium sulfate has got important interactions with muscle relaxation so it would be very prudent to have neuromuscular monitoring in case you are going in for general anesthesia and um, these patients tend to have a loss of muscle tone and hypotony if the magnesium is sort of reaching near 
therapeutic levels or even higher than that so it will be also good to have magnesium values if, if at all that is possible but even if it isn't we must remember that they tend to potentiate the action of the non depolarizing muscle relax so we must take care of that so extubation in particular should be carefully done thank you uh, Ma'am, in your experience, what would we use for post-operative analgesia? You said uh, we could use a paracetamol. Any experience with tramadol or? Uh, the problem is that with any kind of opioid, we are very um, uh, a bit uh, you know finicky, I would say. So we would rather hazard uh, a, an agent which is controllable in small IV doses. So still, fentanyl probably would be a better agent to use than tramadol. Tramadol, you necessarily have to give it in a sort of a slightly larger dose, it may not have much effect. But fentanyl is very, very titratable and uh, titratable to effect. So I think fentanyl scores um, in the, you know, if we have that. Could, could we use um, ultrasound guided blocks and all if the platelet ultrasound counts? Ultrasound guided blocks have been uh, recommended, but the only side or uh, the problem with them is that they are very short acting and uh, they may uh, provide the patient analgesia for up to eight hours postpartum. But uh, some in some patients, it may not be adequate, especially if there's been a lot of handling of the uterus in case the patient had bled and there was some atony, then we all know that the obstetricians exercise the uterus and there's a lot of visceral manipulation. So patients may still be uncomfortable. Although having said that, definitely tab blocks, bilateral tab blocks have been recommended. But in the face of an ongoing DIC, I think it may not be a very good idea because it can actually compound the problem. Sure. Absolutely. I think do, if we do not have any further questions, shall we uh, wind up this session? Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Nuala and Dr. Rajesh ma'am. Thank you for having us over here. Thank you so much. And I think you were very patient and the whole thing went off here and there. I hope I didn't uh, over the time part because I was really very scared. I you know, shouldn't uh, shoot the time. No, you were very much within the time and you went on so fluently and it was always excellent as all, as always, I would say. Absolutely. Really, really a good talk and informative. Thank, thank you so much, ma'am. And thank you, Dr. Noel. And thank you, Dr. Angelina for co-hosting this session with me. Thank you, Dr. Sunan. Thank also, and you me. and uh, Angelina, two thank angels. You. Thank you. <laughs> it's always nice to have you. <laughs> Angels of AOA. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you.